In this lecture, I want to give an overview of the extensible markup language, also known as XML. Now, many of you are familiar with HTML, the hypertext markup language, and I'm sure that you've done some type of web page or something of that nature at some point in your life where you were either using an editor that did a WYSIWYG view of HTML or you were doing a direct edit of the text for an HTML document. Well, HTML is an example of a kind of document that is a markup language for one that has some type of structure. Some of the newer versions of HTML or the, the more newer, more recent standards for HTML require, to, require you to have a document that is structured using XML standards. In the past, HTML was a little more or a little less strict in regards to what you needed to do with a document in terms of having tags that matched and a number of other things. Uh, until and then now with uh, with HTML you're required to follow a standard that is very much like XML in, in the sense that you do have some stricter rules about the way things should be structured. There are a number of different ways to use XML and XML uh, I would consider a more general language. It is something that does not necessarily have to be displayed unlike HTML. HTML is something that you're going to render on a page. XML is just a more general way of representing data. Um, there's actually several uses of, of XML uh, and you see this in, in many different fields. It isn't just computer science anymore that requires the use of XML to do encodings of documents. You find in the humanities domain, for instance, they have a standard called the text encoding initiative format that basically requires people in the humanities to encode their documents using an XML standard. The financial industry is starting to use XML and you'll find even things like the movie industry and news or the news industry all require some form of XML to uh, for one, structure their data, to describe their data, to, and to exchange their exchange information well, um, between different organizations. One of the things that you can do with XML, for instance, is use it to describe how to visualize a document. This is exactly what XML does. Uh, you also have uh, a way of using XML to describe data. Um, Specifically, uh, you have elements within a document that, uh, that are described with metadata to indicate what the data actually represents. And we'll see some of this in an example that we're going to do here in this lecture. Another thing that data is used for is, is exchanging information. In the web services area, this is especially true because XML is used essentially to encode what functions are being called and the data being passed between functions, as well as being used to provide the structure for the data that's returned by a service. We will actually see some of this later in the semester when we look at XML RPC, which is a kind of web service or a standard for a kind of web service that describes data using XML, describes the function calls and describes the return values and the actual data passed between a client and a server, all using XML. There are basically two different perspectives that you can take with respect to XML. One of them is a doc document-centric perspective. The other one is a data-centric uh, perspective. In the document-centric perspective, the data is basically structured or is semi-structured content uh, with the XML or in the case of the example that we see here, the HTML 
providing information on how the data is supposed to be displayed. So with something like a document-centric XML, the, the idea is that the data can be long-lived. So static HTML documents, you know that this thing is going to be around for a while, and you use basically, uh, in the case of HTML, you're using HTML to describe how to actually display the data that's, um, that's being saved. So looking here at this sample document, you'll see that we basically have HTML here, and it's and the information on the tags or the tags themselves indicate how to actually represent the data. So for instance, um, well, and then when I say represent, how to actually visualize the data. So for instance, H1 tells me to provide a large header that will basically say skateboard usage requirements. And then there's a P that indicates that I should create a new paragraph and a B that says I should create bold font for fast glide and so forth. So in this case here, the XML, or in the case the specifically, this is, this is old HTML, is being used to indicate how to actually visualize the data. Now in data-centric XML, the idea here is that you're using XML to provide metadata about the contents or the contained information uh, within, or the, the information contained within the document. So typically with data-centric XML, you are creating a representation that is for the most part going to be analyzed and processed by machines. Uh, but, and I'm, when I say machine, I mean by a computer. So it's typically not something that's meant for human consumption, although the tags that you actually create are things that hopefully are meaningful to the humans that actually have to encode them. But really the idea here is to provide the type of encoding that will make it convenient for tools to be able to consume um, the, uh, the actual data, for tools to be able to manipulate the data and transform it in a number of different ways, including transforming the data into an HTML so that it can actually be uh, viewed by a human. So the data with a, data, with a, a document with a data-centric XML perspective or using a data-centric uh, XML perspective can be short-lived. So it might be generated and used for doing a short transaction. It might uh, it might only exist for uh, the length of making a call and receiving data back from uh, from a service. So, and this is the this is the case, for instance, with web services. The XML documents that are created in this data-centric XML perspective only uh, are are only used uh, to facilitate the interaction between the two computers. So, here's an example of some XML and this sort of makes the point that XML typically isn't meant for human consumption. You look at something like this, this is from an RSS feed from a few years ago uh, that basically shows uh, all of the different tags, but it also has all the data that's contained within it and pretty much in an unreadable form, uh, at least unreadable by humans. And you know, if you're able to eyeball this and, and say exactly what's in here, uh, and, and be able to do this you know, within a larger XML RSS feed, then probably <laughs> you're, uh, uh, you've probably had a lot of experience for one with XML. But this is, this is something that really isn't intended for a human to use. This is something that's intended for a parser to consume and then present into, to the user in a more readable form. Now, when we look at XML, it is structured in a way that allows us to, uh, I guess, transform it into other forms. Uh, there's this thing called XML serialization that basically takes an XML document like we have here and parses all this information and puts it into Java classes. So we could do something like, you know, the information in the previous slide with all that XML, we could take all that information, write a parser, serialize the XML data and put it into 
a Java class that looks something like this uh, here on the screen with the title, link, description, and publication date, and a free burner link. Also that we could do more with it uh, with a computer program. If you were to represent the XML from the previous slide uh, in something like a UML, then the data could be put into something like is shown here on the left. Uh, again, it's representing the same structure and the same data. It's just represented in a different way, a more graphical form here. Uh, the previous slide, this one here, shows it in, the, in its XML form. Now, all of these are basically equivalent representations. It's just that the XML represents it in something that's uh, a little more usable in terms of being able to parse it and use it, whereas these representations here are more abstract and are meant mostly, this is mostly for, for human consumption, right? So UML, that's something that's, that we use as, as developers. We can look at a diagram like that and understand what it means. Same thing, with the, same thing goes with the Java. Now, the, X, the structure of the XML documents is shown here in this model. I also have it here in text on the left-hand side. The components of an XML document are a prolog, then you have elements, and then uh, these are all structured in a document uh, as shown here at the bottom of the uh, left-hand column. You have the prolog followed by a root element and then a number of elements um, contained within that. If you look at the UML model on the right-hand side, this shows this in a little more detail. Uh, a couple of things to, to note here. So we have an XML document. And it shows here that uh, contained within an XML document is a root, and that there is only one root within an XML document. You also see that an XML document has a prologue. What this doesn't show is that there is an ordering uh, with uh, these two classes, I guess, and instances of these two classes. A prologue does come before a root in an XML document. Now, an XML document itself is an element, and uh, an element can contain many um, elements, so you have a nesting structure within, uh, within the XML. And uh, elements can be attributed, and we'll talk about what attributes are within an XML element um, here in a moment. And then also, uh, the other thing to note here is that a root is also an element, and it's just a kind of element within the XML. So that's all very abstract. Let's take a look at an example here in the next slide that shows an X a sample XML document. Okay, so first of all, uh, one of the things that I want to point out here is that there is a prolog. We saw that in the previous slide here that a XML document contains a prolog. The prolog within uh, these documents is basically a header indicating that we do have an XML document uh, and we indicate which version of XML we're actually using. In this case, I'm using version 1.0. And then we indicate the type of encoding that's used for the characters within the document, and typically this is going to be UTF-8. You notice here that we have this, uh, this angle bracket question mark and angle bracket question mark, or um, question mark angle bracket. So they, these are used to uh, indicate that you have a, or you're encoding the uh, a processing directive within, uh, within the XML. The next part of this XML document is the root. There is only, and I'll indicate, I'll show you this later, but there's only should only be one root within an XML document, and we saw that previously in the uh, in the UML diagram. So that is the root node. There's only one, and it's the first level within or within the tree that's contained within a, an XML document, and then contained within this uh, within this root is a an element called subject in this case and then we also have something called an attributed element which is university university has an attribute called campus in this case the attribute the named attribute is actually Oxford so this basically says we have a university that's um, the uh, uh, the attribute is Oxford, and the name of the university is Miami University. 
So we can have a number of different kinds of XML elements. There are content types. Uh, the first type is a content only type, so it's entirely nested elements only. I'll show you an example of this um, uh, in a moment. I believe I will. Actually, we have an example on the previous slide. So uh, this is, here is a, a content element right here. It's name. So it, there's own, there, it's entirely nested elements only, so you can't have both nestings and, and other things within it. So uh, another kind of uh, element is a mixed content element. So you can have uh, not just um, not just the contained data, but also some a mixture of text within it. I have an example of this actually on on the next slide. And then you can have empty content tags, which just basically have nothing within them. So here's my tag; it has nothing within it. Or uh, within the XML, you can just say my tag slash. And you use this a lot of times when uh, the schema requires that you have a tag, but then there's no related data to it. So uh, you will see that you'll actually see a lot of these empty content tags uh, in uh, in a lot of XML documents. So let's look at an example of mixed content. So in mixed content, you can have something like shown here at the bottom. You can have a tag that has both a contained tag within it plus data. So this and then allowed. That, that would be, this would be considered mixed content as far as XML is concerned. Um, okay, so one of the things that you can do is you can nest tags within uh, the XML. Uh, and these tags uh, must not be overlapping. They must be strictly nested. So for instance, you can't have a tag and then a, open another tag and then close the first one before closing the second one. Uh, a nice analogy that, I, um, that I've seen is that uh, you can draw a W and, well, I'll show you this in class. But anyway, so there's the idea here is that you, know, you cannot have uh, something being closed before closing the, um, the you cannot close the first tag before closing a second tag. And I think that as programmers you probably have a pretty good sense of this uh, as far as opening and closing parentheses or opening and closing uh, curly braces within a program. Uh, the bottom part here, this is a properly nested tag. Um, this is This shows mixed content like I was mentioning before. But it, it is a properly nested, uh, a proper way of nesting tags within the XML. Okay, so let's look at this next slide. Uh, and, well, let's talk about root, root elements. I mentioned before that an XML document can only have uh, one document root. So we went back to this slide right here. You see it here that I have an XML document and there's only one root in this document. So if I look at this slide here, this is an invalid document. It has basically the same content in it as the, in the first piece right here. But you see here that we have another, uh, another grouping for course that uh, represents another course. But within this document, this would be an invalid document because we now have two roots. Uh, we would, what we would want to have is perhaps a a structure within the schema, a schema for these documents that would basically uh, enclose several courses within one root tag. But anyway, so this is an invalid document because we have multiple roots. Now XML documents can be thought of as a tree and given that uh, you can use um, tree ter terminology to uh, to talk about different parts of an XML document. So there is a root uh, and then elements within a uh, within an XML document can have parents, they can have children and siblings and descendants and so forth. So looking at our original document, you know, we have a root here, we have siblings um, between subject and number, those two things would be siblings and title uh, those are all siblings uh, with, because they're all within the same level of course. 
Uh, you have ancestors, so if I'm looking at subject, an ancestor of subject would be course, and a descendant of course would be, uh, would be year. So anyway, you can use, like I said, you can use the same sort of tree terminology that you use uh, in the tree data, data structure. Now attributes are a way to further describe data being contained within tags. So one example would be to have a rank attribute within an instructor tag um, to describe the content. So Gerald Gennad and then would be the instructor and one of the attributes for instructor would be rank and my rank would be an associate professor. Now this is an alternative representation uh, to what you could do with uh, an XML schema, which would be to say, well, I have an instructor and then have another tag that's nested within that, a child tag that would be called associate professor. And it really all depends on the creator of the XML schema as to whether it should be structured one way or the other. And one of the things that um, we're going to talk about here next is uh, an idea of an XML schema which basically allows us to determine what the structure of an XML document is going to be. Now typically we're, you're probably more used to something like XHTML or HTML where the schema is already predefined. And one of the unique aspects of XML, I mean the extensibility part of the uh, extensible markup language, uh, is this ability to, de ability to describe your own documents describe the structure of what the data should look like. And basically, similar to creating something like a database schema, you create an XML schema that says, okay, you know, I can have a certain number of elements within the document, they have to be structured in certain ways, they have to be nested in certain ways, and so forth. So an XML schema then defines the structure of an XML document. Now XML schemas on their own are also XML documents, so they have to be structured using uh, some kind of schema, or at least they have to be structured using some well-defined rules. Uh, I will create a, I will have a, uh, a podcast, a screencast, that will show you how to create an XML schema as well as create some other XML documents. Um, so anyway, for the most part, um, all schemas and documents uh, that, uh, that we will use for the most part are automatically generated, uh, but uh, one of the things that you do need to do is be able to understand what the structure of an XML document is, understand the structure of an XML schema, and then later uh, if we ever do any type of, uh, uh, of web services in this course, which we may do a couple, uh, you're going to need to know how to structure the document in such a way so that it follows some very specific XML rules. So one of the simplest things that we can do is define our own element within the XML. So for instance, I can, def I can describe an element called subject within the XML, and I can say what its type is going to be. This would be similar to naming a variable uh, within, uh, within Java and saying what its type can be. Uh, in this case here, if I create this element called subject and then create a type and say that it's of type string, then what I can do in my XML document then is use this subject heading uh, any number of times, well, depending on, on the way the schema is uh, described. Uh, but I can use a subject heading a subject tag, and then the data that's contained within that must be a string. One of the other things that we can do is uh, define complex types. So this describes an element uh, with attributes like sequence and choice. So uh, with uh, a complex type, and I say sequence, this would mean that I have to, I'm defining a tag that has within it a sequence of other tags that have to follow a certain uh, a certain ordering. Uh, in the case of the example that I have here, I'm defining a complex type 
and I'm saying that within that complex type that I have an element called name. And this would be contained within another type called university. So what this allows me to do is create this structure within an XML document where I have university and within that I have um, name uh, as a sub tag or a child tag and I can put Miami University in there. One of the other things that's shown here is uh, the use of an attribute. Uh, I will talk about attributes here in a moment, but basically what this does is allows me to attach the name of some attribute to the, uh, to the previous element that's been defined. Another thing that I can do with an XML is with an XML schema is name my types, name my, com my complex types. This allows me then to uh, to reuse these complex types within other parts of my document. Uh, previously on this other slide here, this complex type um, that had within it this name, this was this was what is called an anonymous type. It has no name attached to it, so I can't reuse it. So if I want to use this structure again later, I have to, uh, I have to recreate it within my schema. Whereas here, in, uh, in naming my complex type, I can reuse my node anywhere that I want. And we'll see examples of this when we start to create our own um, XML schemas and create our own XML documents. Okay, so one so here okay, yeah so here's an example of um, of using that uh, that named complex type. So I have an element called my root, and now what I'm doing is within that I'm saying that I have a sequence of elements underneath that, uh, one of which is called my node. I could have other ones as part of this, but I'm saying that I only have one. This allows me to create a structure that has, uh, and I don't have this in an example that's written out, but I have my root, and then I would have it underneath that another tag called my node. My node would follow the rules that were specified here, which uh, looks like to me allows for an attribute within within the node. So anyway, so that's the ba those are some of the basic ideas of XML schemas. I think that it's best illustrated using some examples. So I'll have some screencasts that show that um, in some of these following episodes. And you'll also have some experience creating and using XML documents within the labs that we're going to do uh, in class. So there's a number of tools that are available. I don't typically use this first one, although if you're uh, if you want to have some type of editor for doing XML documents, you can use something like this. Uh, I typically just use Emacs or something else to just create an XML documents um, that way. Sometimes I'll, I will use Visual Studio because I said it has a really nice XML editor. Um, but anyway, it's pretty much your choice. There's other. There's another. Uh, tool that I like to use that's an XML schema validator. We'll see this in an upcoming episode. It shows you how to create your schema and then you can use this validator to determine whether or not your schema is correct. And then a lot of popular languages, Java, C Sharp to name a couple, uh, have support for XML parsing um, and a lot of libraries that allow you to uh, basically parse in manipulate and do a number of other things with uh, with XML input. Anyway, that concludes this lecture.